Why do you think it is, Viv, that more women are self-conscious about speaking in public than men? I wrote the book How to Own the Room and started the podcast in 2018. And it was really aimed from the beginning at women. I've only ever really interviewed women on the podcast, like 99% women. We've had a few men because I don't want it to be a completely closed conversation. But the book was always aimed at women. And I always had it in my mind that this is something that women really care about and worry about. I always knew, though, that this is not as gendered an issue as we think and since uh, you know this has been going now for five years i've been talking about that about this issue like since the book came out and the podcast has become more popular i have more and more men all of the time coming to it and saying why have you done this just for women it's not fair we are really nervous about public speaking too so i think sometimes um it is it is true that statistically if you were to measure this um you probably would find higher levels of anxiety amongst women whether that's because they really are that nervous or that they've been taught socially that it's okay for them to say that because i hear a lot of men saying that they feel it's not okay for them to admit nerves around this. Whereas for women, it's almost the opposite, that you're not allowed to show off if you actually quite like public public, public speaking and you're not nervous. I mean, you're not allowed to say that as a woman. So I think part of it is to do with context. And the other part of it is to do with how we're treated at work, how we feel we're treated at work, the opportunities that we feel that we get. And all of that is, you know, played out across the board in all different industries. You know, you and I, Louise, have been writing about this and talking about this for getting on 30 years (laughs) and really nothing ever changes. You know, we go two steps forward, one step back in terms of how many women are on the board and how many women are represented on panels and all of that. It's represented across all industries. And of course, there's great hope for change uh, and change is always happening all the time. But uh, I do get kind of quite angry about this sometimes because it does persist in having this gender slant that women are at some kind of disadvantage. So this book and this podcast is really part of trying to open up that conversation and ask why and try and put, try to put a stop to it. One of the things you talk about is that uh, individuals seem to think they have to wait to be asked and you are encouraging people to grab the opportunity to speak. Um, do you think that's changing in younger women? Yeah, definitely. This is definitely a, a generational issue. Um, it's, it's very, very hard to talk in generalities about this, though. Uh, I do hear from some younger women that they feel very emboldened and empowered to do things and they don't care um, what other people think of them. They don't want to wait and they, they get it. But then I hear from other younger women and from their parents in particular that they're quite paralyzed and and not confident at all and don't want to take up opportunities. So it's a very, very mixed picture. I think sometimes it depends on personality, on upbringing, on your education, the examples around you, um, how your mental health is. I I think it's very difficult to to say that for definite, that it's kind of in inverted commas easier for younger women. Um, I do hear very different stories from say women over 50, 50, 60, 70, 80, particularly on the podcast where they feel that the opportunities that they took and the way that they behaved often around quite serious jobs or in public speaking in particular, they had to almost, in inverted commas, behave like a man. I mean, it's a very sort of 1970s, 1980s idea that you think there's this fixed way of being and you have to be that way, otherwise you're not gonna be taken seriously. And the thing I'm always trying to tell people really comes from my own experience in stand-up comedy which I started over 10 years ago but when I was in my late 30s that in many walks of life the truth is whether you're a man or a woman or you know whatever category of, of life you assign yourself in you might be the first to do something and you might have to do it your own way And it might be that there isn't any particular standard for you to match up to anyway. So it's okay to experiment. It's okay to try things a bit differently. It's okay to mess up. 
And I think that that is something that we weren't told 20 years ago. And now you get so many podcasts and conversations with so many different people. It's so much more open, that conversation, where even much older people are admitting uh, actually, I was kind of making it up as I go, as I went along. I got loads of things wrong along the way. I really messed up. You know, that that conversation is much more open now. And I think that is the truth about how you become good at things is that you learn how to do it your own way um, mm. without copying other people, maybe taking inspiration from other people. But you learn to do it by experimenting. And it's only by experimenting and sometimes getting it a bit wrong that you find your way towards something that feels comfortable for you. Um, in your in the podcast, how, how to own the room, you speak to women from politics, sport, the arts, business. Do you think there's any one area where it really still remains the hardest to be heard as a woman? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, which do I think is the most difficult industry? I think sometimes the industries that we think are young where we think that there will be the most latitude for different norms of behavior, like the tech industry. Mm -hmm. um, I often hear from especially younger women, um, and I've done a lot of work at conferences and networking events and all of those kind of things with women who work in those industries, that it's actually really, really difficult. So these norms of you have to be a certain kind of person to fit into this role you have to be a certain age to match up to this that and the other those things p uh, persist uh, even if an industry is very young and that's something that I find really quite interesting um, I've done some work with women um, in places like Google and Facebook um, where they're being promoted to high positions at a very young age and you'd think that that's a really, really good sign. But when they're in that position, they feel as if they don't necessarily know how to behave or what the norms are. So I think sometimes we might imagine, oh, well, when you work in this industry, such and such industry, you can dress how you want, you can behave how you want. But sometimes I think when there hasn't been a precedent and there isn't a set way of behaving or a set way even of dressing, even knowing what to look like sometimes is a problem in some of, in some of these um, at, at senior level. Um, I think that that can be really, really difficult. Um, of course, industries like um, everything in show business, entertainment, um, all the actresses that I've interviewed on the podcast, everybody who works for television, um, all of those industries are always going to be very, very bound by aesthetics. And that's always something that women want to talk about a lot because it's still really problematic. And I think it probably always will be because those are industries where you're always judged on your looks. So those things are always quite interesting. And that's the conversation that is always slightly awkward in terms of how to in the room, because I've never wanted to make this about... Um, make sure that you wear a power suit and <laughs> make sure that you've got your shoulder pads in, you know, all those kind of old fashioned ideas that you have a set way of looking and then you're going to be okay. Um, we stray into that sometimes uh, on the podcast, but a lot of, again, there's a generational, a generational divide there too, where older women will feel quite comfortable talking about this because they will have had to make a decision of, oh, okay, I need to look this way. Younger women maybe don't feel so comfortable talking about it because they feel as if, they're betraying something by admitting that they have thought about this <laughs> so it's so fascinating every a lot of people still feel this way a lot of people still harbor these insecurities but at the same time they know that they're not supposed to anymore because of body shaming and acceptance of lots of different body sizes and many of these really inspiring examples that we see on social media and um you know amazing women of all different shapes and sizes, uh, which we wouldn't have seen, I think, in yeah. the 70s and the 80s, um, who are saying, you're, you know, you're not allowed to hate yourself anymore. So there's a very, very uncomfortable emotional reaction there, I think, for people that they feel that insecurity and maybe that stops them from doing things, but then they have the added guilt of feeling the insecurity because so they have like a double insecurity they have insecurity about their insecurity um my way of dealing with this and again it really comes from the fact that i went from 
being somebody who was always behind a computer doing my legacy media journalism until about 10 years ago, which I still do, um, having to be more public and having to do stuff on stage in stand up and having to be on TV and all that kind of thing. And I learned pretty quickly that the way you need to deal with that that is healthy is to be able to think, I've ticked that box and now I can forget about it. So what I try to do is, is set certain standards for myself. I'm going to have this much time to get ready, this much time to worry about this thing, this much time to choose whatever. And then I'm going to forget about it. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that also from a lot of women on the podcast that this is a useful way of thinking about it is allow yourself the time to worry about this thing, to kind of put it to bed. Mm -hmm. And then once you are out in front of people doing whatever you're doing, all you want them to focus on is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And if they want to comment on what you're wearing, what you look like, your hair, the color of whatever, then that's okay. That's that's their problem. It's got nothing to do with you. You you advocate in the book therapy if people re are really struggling with anxiety in speaking in public. How do you think therapy would help in that situation? Well, I think there are two kinds of anxiety um, that you can talk about in relation to public speaking and one is a what I would call maybe a bodily like a physical anxiety um and that is manifesting itself with physical symptoms so there's a lot of women again I've talked to on the podcast who have even women in the public eye who do public speaking and television appearances all the time who use medication and they see a doctor you know to cope with their external uh, sorry their internal manifestations or even external like if they're literally shaking so there are certain physical aspects to this that are to do with how you feel and your response to that fight or flight um you know some people take beta blockers for this you know that you need to see a professional about that so that is one kind of anxiety and I think that is very it's very specific you know it's a handful of people who experience that and need to have that help then you've got much more kind of normal, average anxiety. I should really say, yeah, there are three types of anxiety, actually. So there's that kind, which is almost you know, a physical condition that requires medication. Mm -hmm. The second kind is normal, average anxiety around public speaking that really just comes from the fact that you're doing something you care about. And that's the sort of anxiety that we all need to talk about much more openly. You can speak to anybody in the public eye who ever does anything interesting and they will if they're a good person, they will admit that they experience it and that they would worry if they didn't because it often means you just don't really care anymore. So that's a kind of good anxiety. And a lot of people reframe it as well as actually excitement. So that's a very sort of low level, I'm nervous, I'm excited, I'm anxious, I really want to do this thing. It's, it's, it's stressful, but in a good way, it's that kind of feeling. And that isn't the sort of anxiety where you need to see a therapist or a doctor it's an anxiety you need to talk to people about to share stories about how to lessen your nerves to accept it to maybe use a meditation app um, to do some breathing before you go on stage to make sure that you're really grounded on the floor all that kind of thing and then there's a third type <laughs> which is what I would say is I don't want to say it's personality based or experience based but it's really that kind of low level hum at the back of your life where you're always a bit down on yourself um you're maybe anxious in a lot of different situations you have certain insecurities that come up for you a lot of the time you're maybe not functioning in the way that you would if you were feeling better about yourself and that of course is going to be carried in to your public speaking life mm -hmm. um, it's probably going to mean that you'll get even more of those other two kinds of anxiety uh, it's probably going to mean that you won't even put yourself in those situations because you won't feel up to it. And that's the kind of anxiety I think um, that I would and I have see a therapist about because there are issues there. Um, and a therapist can really easily, <laughs> well, not easily, it's not easy work, but they are the one who will be able to help you through that. Uh, it's not a short process. It's not a quick fix uh, in a way that, you know, the anxiety piece of, you know, maybe you've got shaking and you need beta blockers, or maybe you've got some mild anxiety and you need to breathing exercises. Those are quick fix. Therapy fix 
because you're holding yourself back from things in life that's a longer fix but it really is worth doing and I think it protects you more from those other superficial manifestations of anxiety mm. Uh, I wondered too about, um, you give a lot of examples of really great uh, speakers and people in themselves, people like Michelle Obama, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, uh, Virginia Woolf even. How how can basing yourself on people whose lives are much more extraordinary and, and you know, their whole, they just seem like stars, you know, how can stars uh, inspire us without at the same time making us feel worthless and like we'll never live up to those uh, levels yeah that's a really important such an important question and I think about this a lot um it's very difficult sometimes with this business of asking what can women do to feel better about themselves and look like leaders feel senior feel up to this task what, what can they, what can be done to inspire them to feel that way and the easiest way to show that and to talk about that and to discuss it and to ask does this work does it not work does this appeal to you does it not appeal to you is to use celebrities because we all know who they are you know that's one of the you know clearly I use Michelle Obama as an example because she is brilliant you know I think she's probably the greatest public speaker of the last 100 years uh, especially you know, she has a lot of leeway in her public speaking because she's not an elected uh, elected official. She speaks as a, as a private individual. And so I think her speaking is very interesting in that regard. Um, but I use her because people can picture her and because they can go away and look at loads of examples. I'm always quite careful in everything that I write and I say, because I use hundreds of different examples of, of different people for this. I'm always careful to say, I'm not telling you to be like this person. I'm telling you to look and see what this person does, how it works on them, and ask how it might look like on you. And if I can find examples of like the early days of someone like that, how she found her way towards that style, because Michelle Obama has talked about that quite a lot, that in the early days of her public speaking, she wasn't comfortable. She didn't know how to stand. She didn't know how much she could gesture. Um, she didn't know how you put together a good speech. You know, I'm, I'll always bring out those stories if I possibly can to try to say, you know, these things are very rarely ready made. Nobody, hardly anybody comes to this fully formed at the moment that you see them when they're brilliant. A lot of work has gone into that and you can find a way to do that work for yourself. Um, it does annoy me sometimes that I use so many <laughs> celebrity examples because I agree with you. It, it Sometimes it can be another excuse for people. Oh, well, I won't bother because I'm never going to be as good as Michelle Obama. She's amazing. <laughs> um, and I don't want people to feel that way. But these examples are useful because they give they provide us with a common language and a starting point so that's the excuse I'm giving myself and <laughs> it's a good lesson as well I think for us to learn like don't be intimidated that's such a key uh, message from Michelle Obama herself you know she says I've been in all the biggest rooms all the best rooms all the most important and private rooms with the scariest people in the world you know from the United Nations to however many governments um, and I'm telling you they're not all that <laughs> very good good advice on that and finally I wonder if you could share some of the physical tips that you give in the book um, a few words that will help people to bring to mind at that point when they're about to open their mouth and speak in public whatever it is you know at someone's birthday party or you know because they're the chairman of the board or you know they're they're accepting an oscar what are the just a couple of things that you think will really help one of the most useful things to think is where are my feet some of these are just really silly and that's what I like about these tips because they are light and keeping it light, lighthearted, um, just full of warmth and kindness towards yourself. It's a good way of going about it. So if you can just think to yourself, next time I'm nervous, I'm going to think, where are my feet? And even just that thought, I'm not suggesting there's any science in the, behind this, by the way, I'm not a scientist. Um, just that thought it will make you think, oh, yeah, where is my energy? How grounded am I? How is my posture? Am I relaxed? 
am I feeling like there's enough energy in my body and it's not all kind of up here going, oh my God, what am I going to say? What's everyone going to think of me? Everybody's looking at me. Am I not going to remember what I'm going to say? What you're trying to do is keep away from that. So thinking, where are my feet? And even if you're wearing very high heels, you know, you can even do this in very uncomfortable shoes or you can do this in bare feet. Just thinking, where are my feet? It can even be very grounding if you are, say, I don't know, doing a job interview um, on a um, on a Zoom, right? Just thinking, where are my feet? Immediately, I'm doing it now. <laughs> Immediately <laughs> makes you think, oh yeah, okay, everything's fine. It just brings you back into your body. The other part of that, so where are my feet? The other part of that is an exercise I talk about all of the time that's called brain and stomach breathe through feet. And this is a breathing exercise that augments that idea. So wherever you are, you could do this in a meeting, you could do this ahead of a stressful moment, you could do this just to reset. You think to yourself, brain and stomach. So you take a breath and you let your brain drop into the pit of your stomach, brain and stomach. And again, it just kind of pushes your energy down, breathe through feet. And it's really hammering home the idea of being grounded, being in your body, making sure that you're comfortable where you are, brain and stomach, breathe through feet. And those things, they really act as a, I guess it's just a placebo of taking a moment, you know, actually having a process where you think, I'm not going to forget to take a moment. You know, very often I still see people ahead of a stressful public speaking moment or ahead of even going on, walking on stage on, on TV or something. There's people checking their phone. Um, that's the crazy thing to do. Uh, this is the opposite of that, where you think, I'm not going to forget to take a moment. And in that moment, I'm going to think, where are my feet? Brain and stomach, breathe through feet. Absolutely fantastic. I can feel my feet breathing as we... <laughs> Great. Good. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. And how long ago was it that the book came out? Just remind us. Well, How to Own the Room came out in 2018. So it's, yeah. Five, five years and still years, selling still strong. strong. Yeah. yeah. And the and the podcast, you've done how many series of, of that? Uh, we've done 19 series now. Wow. So, yeah. so over 100 different people have been interviewed about it. Well, yeah. well done. It's terrific. Congratulations. And thanks Thank for talking you. to us. Thank you so much. Okay.